Now, most of the time, narcissistic ghosters will not come back and hoover. Now, it certainly, certainly can happen, but the ghosters do tend to be the ones with the avoidant attachment style. So they are the ones who leave the kitchen as soon as the heat comes on, and then they tend not to come back into the kitchen again. Today we're going to take on a very common issue in narcissistic relationships called the silent treatment. If you've ever experienced it, you know what it is. Before I start talking about the silent treatment though, please hit that subscribe button and join this channel. Hit that bell if you want to get notifications. And as always, when you come up with ideas for videos, please don't hesitate. Drop them down in the comments because it's your suggestions that often drive the kinds of content I research and develop. So let's talk about the silent treatment. It is so frustrating, okay? If you've ever been through it, you're like, oh, I know what you're talking about. The silent treatment is definitely one of the key weapons in the narcissist's arsenal. Many of you have asked me about this. I've gotten countless comments, emails, you name it. So here we go. Uh, maybe this belonged in the glossary series. I don't know. Regardless, here it is. So do with it what you will. So the silent treatment is exactly what it sounds like. Now, let's give me give you, I'll give you an example. One day, perhaps you have an argument with somebody narcissistic or difficult in your life, or maybe you issue a small criticism, or they just didn't like something you said or did. That happens, and they just stop talking to you. They just stop. Now, if you don't live with them, they may stop answering any communications and may stop responding and stop reaching out. If you do live with them, they will live in silence with you. And if you talk to them, they will either ignore you or if it is essential, they may say something. At best, they'll give you a one word answer. Yes, no, over there, or they'll engage in a verbal gesture. Hey, you'll say, hey, where's the keys? And they will then put the keys in front of you and walk away without a word. Now, if you have ever lived with any of this, you know it, and it is miserable. You would almost just rather have the fight and not deal with this. It is an uncomfortable, and very difficult way to live. And it's always kind of hanging over your head, this idea that, oh my gosh, the silent treatment is going to come again. So let's talk about the five classical reasons for the silent treatment. The first reason, the first reason is stonewalling or manipulation. In other words, what they're doing is they're using the silent treatment as a way to maybe draw out an apology, to punish you, to get you to do something that they mo may want to do um, or want you to do. So it's very much this, by stonewalling you, the reason it's considered to be a form of manipulation is because then it becomes a way of using their silence almost as a sort of a source of power of sorts. So that is one reason that they do engage in the silent treatment. It just becomes a manifestation of stonewalling with the result of manipulation and then you end up behaviorally doing something they want or in essence they kind of almost get their needs met. The second thing that is seen within the silent treatment is gaslighting. What we can sometimes see is that they will, when somebody gives you the silent treatment, it almost feels as though your reality is being absolutely denied. You are in a room and you're with a person and they are not talking to you. And you're thinking, is this really happening? And then you might even start blaming yourself. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. This is my fault. Let me, and instead of seeing that the silent treatment is completely unacceptable, you may actually start twisting your reality in a way that you're blaming yourself and that in some way this silent treatment can actually feel like it becomes acceptable. It's not. A third element 
that is at play in stonewalling is that it's a manifestation of an emotional immaturity or really like a lack of interpersonal skill. When you think about what the silent treatment is, I don't know if you've ever watched a two and a half year old hold his or her breath. They will sometimes hold their breath until they pass out. So it is that I'm going to get my way and then they pass out. That's the silent treatment in an adult. I'm not getting my way. I'm not going to talk. It's a tantrum. It's a quiet tantrum, but it is nonetheless a tantrum. And tantrums are for children. So when somebody is throwing one as an adult through the, the silent treatment, it very much is a manifestation of not only emotional immaturity, but a real lack of interpersonal skill. Because what it really shows is an incapacity to communicate as an adult about something that's uncomfortable. And because narcissists find it so difficult to take personal responsibility for something that they may have said wrong or misunderstood, or they're really not able to find common ground, that lack of interpersonal skill means instead of actually having an evolved adult conversation, they will just simply do the silent treatment, which ultimately is a form of manipulation, which will end up drawing you out and you still have to be the only grown up in the room. Reason number four that can often draw out the silent treatment is dysregulation. And what do I mean by dysregulation? Dysregulation is the inability to regulate emotions in any way. It is why, for example, narcissists are so prone to rage. Something happens to them and they, pum, they blow up instead of, again, having an adult tempered conversation. So when we look at dysregulation with the silent treatment, it's as though there's so much strong, petulant feeling that instead of being able to regulate that feeling, they are actually manifesting this absolutely dysregulated anger by being completely silent. And what it does is it almost creates exactly the same tension as a rage episode would. But because they can't manage strong emotion, they either fully explode or completely withhold. But either way, the emotion is not getting appropriately communicated. And either way, whether rage or silent treatment, it can be experienced as very punitive by the other person in the relationship. A fifth driver of the silent treatment is the chronic victimhood we see in a narcissist. Woe is me. Nothing goes my way. Nobody understands me. I guess I just won't talk. And it can feel very passive aggressive. The victimhood driven silent treatment is something we far more often see in a covert narcissistic pattern. But the silent treatment is a part of every narcissistic pattern I've talked about. For example, in the neglectful narcissistic relationship, the neglectful narcissist lives and dies by the silent treatment. They are almost, it's like permanently what they call home. It's rare that they do talk. The malignant narcissist will often use the, the silent treatment as a form of menace or to control you. The covert narcissist, again, from that place of victimhood. But there is this very victimized sense about all kinds of narcissists, magnified in the covert narcissist, but the silent treatment is as though, woe is me, and it becomes sort of this passive aggressive acting out that ultimately leaves you sometimes even taking the blame in these conversations. A final, <coughs> sorry, a final piece of the silent treatment we haven't considered is the talking through model of the silent treatment. And by that I mean, it's a very manipulative tool that I've talked about in other videos where they won't talk to you, but they will talk through other people. Will you please tell your mother that the keys are hanging by the door? Will you please tell your father that I won't be joining him for dinner? So it's kind of sort of a pseudo silent treatment because obviously you can hear what they're saying, but they're making this, this dramatic histrionic show of, I'm not going to talk to them. I'm only going to talk to whomever this third party is. And if you ever grew up like this, and this is a very triangulated theme, 
where one, a narcissistic parent, will use you as the child, as the communication device, to be able to punish the other spouse with the silent treatment, but then draw their kids into this triangulated space. The silent treatment, although it very much can come through, the stonewalling space, gaslighting, emotional immaturity or lack of interpersonal skill, dysregulation and victimhood, that those are really the five primary drivers for why the silent treatment comes through. It can manifest in many different ways. One word answers, absolute silence, talking through other people, and non-response. No matter what, it is a classical part of a narcissistic relationship. Here's the key though, how do you master it? Don't give into it. You can outplay them. It's a bit like a staring contest you had as a kid. They're gonna give you that silent treatment you're often going to fall into that trap of maybe this is my fault, maybe I need to apologize because you just want to break that tension of the silent treatment. You can really train yourself to not give in and say, okay, I can do, I can do a little bit of a post-it world. I can, I can communicate like this because you have put so much time and effort into trying to save this rather broken, often messy relationship you can out silent treat them. I'm not saying that this is healthy. I think the healthiest path is to communicate in a healthy way. But since they're likely not going to ascribe to that, you can also show yourself the respect and say, I'm certainly not going to blame myself for this. And say that to yourself internally. You don't need to say it to them. And then learn to peaceably exist with them. In fact, I would say you could pretend that if your narcissistic partner or family member is giving you the silent treatment, pretend you're at a silent meditation retreat and try to make the most of it. I don't mean to make light of it, but the fact is the reason narcissists get away with the silent treatment is because it often in, we often enable it because we give them the results we want. We apologize, take the blame, take the responsibility, do anything we can to start the conversation again because it's so tense. You can stick this out, but most importantly, view the silent treatment as the red flag that it is. It is a very unhealthy relationship dynamic. And when it happens, the one thing that you should be hearing loudly in the midst of all this silence is that you're looking at one very big red flag. I hope that clarified some of the issues around the silent treatment. And I know those of you suffering with it, while this may not change it, I hope you understand where it comes from, some ways to cope with it, and different ways it can manifest. So let's talk a little bit about stonewalling. Sort of is like it sounds, but it's not just simply about stone walls. This term is actually part of something we're actually going to be taking on in a future video. But it was an idea submitted by more than a few subscribers to this channel. And when I thought about their suggestion, I agreed. The term stonewalling does actually capture a key term that's important to understand in narcissistic and high conflict relationships. Stonewalling is a refusal to participate in communication or connection in a relationship. In its simplest form, it may be the silent treatment. Stonewalling, the term actually takes in a lot of territory and it represents things and feelings that it brings up are things like abandonment and a refusal to participate in the relationship, especially when the stonewaller isn't happy with, us, with what's going on. Now, the most classical presentation of stonewalling is, in fact, the silent treatment. When you talk to a person and they literally do not respond, you're talking to them and they do not respond, that's the silent treatment. Stonewalling, though, can take other forms. It can manifest as a person who walks away when you are talking or somebody who does not respond to a message, an email, or a call repeatedly, especially when it happens, because they do not want to respond to the conversation or the issue that's being discussed. Now, stonewalling is not someone taking a moment before they respond. It's not someone just simply holding back on responding because they need a moment so they don't react 
and so that they can provide a response that's, you know, that's not hurtful. No, 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 no. That's not what stonewalling is. Stonewalling is unhealthy. Stonewalling occurs when a person does not want to deal with the issue being discussed in the relationship at that time. That issue may, for example, be emotionally evocative. It may also require a person having to take responsibility, whatever that is. And it is something that's very uncomfortable. The topic is something that's very uncomfortable for the stonewaller, which is why they withhold communication, com communication and basically shut things down. Now, stonewalling can also take the form of someone saying, I'm not going to talk about that. I refuse to talk about that. And if you bring it up, I am going to walk away. So stop talking about it. But it, it's just, it stops the conversation. It effectively silences the other person or people in this exchange. And it results over time in issues never being discussed or resolved, as well as sort of this kind of sense of censorship in the relationship, whereby a person may feel as though they are not permitted to bring up a topic for fear of shutting the whole thing down. Now, keep in mind that in some cases, through family therapy or couples therapy, there may have actually been focused work to designate certain topics that are sort of off limits or topics that a family or couple may be asked to wait to discuss before therapy. But that is something that is agreed upon by all the players as part of something that all of you are working on together. And that's not something that just one person, the stonewaller, simply gets to mandate that nobody gets to be talked about. So don't confuse those two issues. Sometimes it does come up in therapy. In this case, I'm talking about stonewalling. Unilaterally, the stonewaller makes that judgment. So why is the term stonewalling relevant to understanding narcissism? It's because stonewalling is a technique that is quite often employed by narcissists. Because one of their core relational approaches, as you guys already know, is manipulation. Stonewalling is the ultimate form of manipulation. It can often result in so much discomfort that the other person just relents. They talk more. They may shift the topic and try to coax the narcissist to talk or come back. And then before you know it, the uncomfortable issue that was being discussed is no longer being talked about anymore. And now the narcissist doesn't even have to think about taking responsibility because you're no longer talking about it. The issue is definitely not resolved and the narcissist is off the hook. How nice. So narcissistic relationships can actually be particularly toxic for people who do struggle with any issues around abandonment. Now, here's the thing. All of us at some level struggle with abandonment to some degree. Nobody, obviously, who cares about someone wants to be abruptly cut off by them or left by them. But if you do actually struggle with slightly deeper issues with abandonment, Stonewalling can feel particularly painful because even if a person doesn't storm out of a room, but instead they just go silent, that is in fact an abandonment. And because of this, stonewalling can be a particularly toxic dynamic because the fear of abandonment or the fear of silence can be so triggering that people just capitulate and give in to avoid it and over time, a whole bunch of issues never get discussed and never get addressed. Now, stonewalling is a powerful means by which a narcissist can exert a lot of control in a relationship. I mean, what they, basically what stonewalling does for them is it raises fears of the things that you can't discuss in a relationship. It raises issues of being shut down in a relationship, of being left alone or having to sit in silence. It can also create an environment 
where you feel like you have to adhere to the narcissist's agendas if you're going to keep the conversation going. Now, stonewalling, as the name implies, means that a relationship gets stuck. In essence, it gets walled off. There is no possibility for addressing relationship ruptures or even an opportunity to feel heard. And in some ways, in most ways, that works really great for a narcissist because for them, relationships are really just a source of supply. So now they don't have to deal with them because they stonewall. The idea of growing a relationship from a place of vulnerability and openness and trust isn't on the radar for them anyhow, so it's just easier. I'm going to stonewall as soon as this relationship becomes uncomfortable. Now, many of you know stonewalling can occur in many narcissistic family systems as well. Most people from narcissistic family systems recognize the dynamic of a parent using the silent treatment to control the entire family dynamic. And this can also be a sibling or someone else in the family system who uses stonewalling. Once again, the family will often end up trying to do whatever they can do to break the silent treatment or break just sort of their kind of dead stare so they can draw the narcissist back out. And once again, using stonewalling, the narcissist can control the entire family system. Now, if you grew up with the silent treatment, you recognize how abusive, how invalidating, and how confusing it can be. And if you are a child, it can be particularly unsettling because it really does feel like abandonment. And since most children are hardwired to please their parents, when a parent goes silent, it can be so frustrating, so saddening, and frankly, quite frightening for a child. And the child will not only go to great strides to draw their parent back out again, they will do anything to avoid the stonewalling. And if you experienced this dynamic as a child, then stonewalling, when it happens in adulthood, can be incredibly triggering. Now, in family systems, the silent treatment can feel almost capricious, like you never know when it is going to happen or what sets it off. So for example, the thing that could set off stonewalling, it could be what feels like an innocuous comment or a relatively small transgression. Like for example, not being able to travel home for Thanksgiving one year because of a work conflict. And then that's when it happens. They stonewall. Because the narcissistic personality tends to take everything so personally, and sometimes years can go by with this silent treatment happening. Years can go by with the narcissist not talking to you. Or better yet, there's a passive aggressive twist on this. They will try to speak through another family member. For example, Mary, can you please tell your brother that I need a ride to the doctor when you, the brother, are sitting right there in front of them? It can feel petty. It can feel childish. And over time, honestly, it can feel really exhausting. Some people actually find themselves feeling quite guilty in the face of stonewalling. In many ways, they might literally take responsibility for this toxic pattern, even though it's being done to them. Now, stonewalling can also result in a lot of game playing in a relationship. They may use sort of a partial silent treatment and say, you know, I could see us starting to talk to each other again if you could just figure out what you did to upset me. That is such a mind F word that you get lost in the abyss of the stonewalling and now the need to mind read. Stonewalling definitely contributes to the eggshell dynamic of these narcissistic and high conflict toxic relationships. The fear of the stonewalling 
means that you may be very and take be very careful very almost very censored because you don't want to set off another multi-year cycle of silence or of watching your partner storm off into the night at its core like I noted, there's a strongly passive aggressive element to stonewalling. It is a cruel sort of acting out that is achieved by not actually actively doing something, but by withholding something. Passive aggressive behavior by definition is really confusing because not only are you hurt by it, but it takes a minute because it's not someone screaming in your face, but rather it's about you being insulted through a back door. The passive piece in this situation, in stonewalling, it's the withdrawal. Narcissists stonewall for the same reason they do most things. Insecurity as well as their disdain and their contempt for intimacy and then throw into that their lack of empathy. Intimacy and sustained closeness really require compromise and even sacrifice in terms of sometimes having to take responsibility for uncomfortable things and talking about topics that may leave any of us feeling vulnerable. It means putting in the work of having the difficult conversations if for no other reason than respect. But since narcissistic relationships are definitely not characterized by respect, that doesn't happen. Intimacy in general, in most cases, by narcissists is a devalued and at best a very superficial state for narcissists. And as a result, stonewalling becomes a viable strategy for them. Why deal with the deep stuff? Just walk out and go silent instead, instead of having to do the real work. And the narcissist takes the stance of who cares about how it leaves the other person feeling as long as I don't need to deal with stuff, I don't need, don't need and want to deal with. Now, the marital researcher John Gottman terms stonewalling as something he calls one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. In essence, these are these behaviors that happen in a relationship that are a foreshadowing of a relationship's ultimate downfall. Overall, stonewalling is ridiculously petty and it's an emotionally stunted manner of managing challenging topics or potential conflicts in a relationship. So you may be wondering, okay, this happens to me. How the heck am I supposed to deal with this? You see it for what it is. And most importantly, you fight against your own triggers of abandonment and past stonewalling, and you don't chase after them. You take a long look at this dynamic and reflect on whether you want to participate in it. But since this is a narcissist, there's no point in explaining this to them. No point in saying that I'm on to you. This is stonewalling. There's no point in trying to teach them about the fact that stonewalling is unhealthy and it makes a relationship get stuck and sort of wither and that this entire cycle is abusive. Doing all of that is going to get you nowhere. Once the stonewalling dynamic is revealed, you can certainly give it the old college try and attempt to address it in couples therapy or family therapy. But I'm gonna be honest with you, if stonewalling is happening in a narcissistic context, the odds of shifting it are pretty close to zero. But I do want to make a disclaimer because I see something that could end up being a little confusing. Some of you may be wondering if no contact qualifies as stonewalling. No, 
because stonewalling occurs within the framework of an ongoing relationship. When no contact happens, you are done and the relationship is behind you. Now, you might be thinking, well, what about gray rock? Isn't that kind of stonewalling? Mm -mm. In gray rock, you are not stopping conversation with them. You are simply and superficially answering questions, trying to keep emotion out of it, and you are not storming off. So no, while gray rock may feel sort of stonewally, it's really not. Stonewalling has been considered by some to be a form of gaslighting because it does doubt your reality and shapeshift your reality. But ultimately, it is a manipulation. It is cruel and it is a favorite tool of narcissists who truly do leave the kitchen when they feel the heat. And by the heat, I mean that need for intimacy and that need for closeness. Stonewalling can definitely happen outside of narcissistic relationships. And it is definitely a dynamic that once it happens in a relationship, your relationship is probably on borrowed time. If it happens in family relationships, these are family relationships that often get stuck and can't grow. But within a narcissistic relationship, it is a common dynamic. And it is one that is almost impossible to address or change. Then it's left to you to figure out, is this something I want to live with? Or is this something that is no longer working for me? So let's take on word salad. It's an interesting one. If you've never heard of this one, it's actually quite interesting. This is a, actually a video where I think I'm going to start with an example. Okay. Uh, hold on to your hat because this is actually a hard example to come up with. Let's say that you are talking with a narcissistic partner about some financial concerns that you were having. The two of you don't typically communicate well and money's a little bit of a challenge. Your partner, he's a gaslighter and he's often in denial about money. He'll often deflect the conversations so he doesn't have to deal. So, okay, you. Let's say you say this. Hey, hon, uh, before you head out to the gym, we just need to take a quick minute to talk about the household budget. There's actually a tax bill that's coming due and I need to make sure that we have the money in the account set up right so I have the funds for it. Okay, now let's just say they respond, your narcissistic partner responds like this, seriously? Seriously, you're going to bring this up now? Bring it up on my way while I'm on my way to something I want to do because I work so hard. God, you never think about my feelings. You never think about what I need. You talk about love and you talk about hate and you talk about what you need. And I, I need things too. What about that family of yours? What did they ever give you? Huh. What did they ever give us? Hmm, I need a car. I need a house. I need things. What about you? What do you do for us? I do so much. And a nicer house would be better for us. Your family knows that. And I work hard. You don't see that. And I needed that. I needed to be seen. Do you see what I need? But you, you just keep reaching for the stars. Why can't you just stay here on the earth? Why, why, why would you need so much more than I give? I can't give you the stars. I give a lot. I work hard. Don't you see that? In school, I was the very best student. And then I was the very best worker. And I just saw someone who said he owes his career to me. I was just 22 and this guy, this guy, he was 45. This guy, he says I was his mentor. I was 22. He was 45. I do so much. I give so much. Okay. So imagine that that was the response. 
to your asking about the tax bill. So in that perky, jerky chaos of words and confusion and twists and turns, I think if we did some decoding, it seems like maybe this person's narcissistic partner feels unappreciated. Or maybe he was trying to say his partner thinks his, thinks his partner's entitled. Or maybe, maybe he thinks the partner's family could have helped out. Frankly, the fact is, who the hell knows what that whole loopy rant was about? But if that happened to you, at that point, you are so confused that you may actually just let the conversation go. Maybe you'd risk asking about it later or better yet, try and figure out this tax bill issue yourself. That lovely interlude I tried to give you an example of was an example of word salad. Word salad in the realm of narcissism is a confused, jumbled up mix of words that don't really hang together fully logically or semantically and definitely aren't a sensible response to what a person says. The sentences by themselves make sense. Like each of those sentences that I gave you in that example, they're grammatically correct, but altogether they don't represent a meaningful response to the question or issue at hand. And they leave the situation even more confused than it was before you spoke. Now, this term word salad is actually used in psychiatry and psychology in another way as well. It's used when we refer to the verbal production of people who have certain mental illnesses or central nervous system illnesses. Like examples would be, for example, schizophrenia or other psychotic illnesses or other issues like dementia. But in these cases, sort of traditional psychiatric word salad, it is almost random words. It might be like, car shop me war, go try so, hop shop chicken song. So there's absolutely no sense, no semantic meaning to the, the chain of words in that kind of word salad. Now, obviously that kind of psychiatric word salad is something far more pathological and indicative of profound mental illness or potentially brain damage. But in narcissism, when we use this term word salad, it's when we talk about these very confused verbal tirades and diatribes that just almost like literally almost feel like they don't make sense. Now, word salad in narcissism definitely has certain characteristics. It can be very circuitous, a person just talking around in circles and never really getting to a point. It can be tangential. For example, the narcissistic person bringing up topics and themes that have nothing to do with the issue that's being discussed. So for example, bringing up that idea in the, in the word sal salad example I gave you, bringing up that idea of being a mentor to some random person years ago had nothing to do with the tax bill. It's confusing when it's tangential because it's not a response to the issue at hand. It's, it is also, word salad can be very deflecting because again, it doesn't address the issue at hand and deflection, in, in fact, is a sort of a form of gaslighting. Word salad can also sometimes be what we call persecutory, meaning that it has an almost conspiratorial or almost paranoid twist to it. A person going on about their victimhood or the fact that you don't get them and nobody gets them. The persecutory piece is not required, but it's not an unusual part of these narcissistic word salads. Now, in a way, word salad, as I suggested, is really a form of gaslighting. Now, while it, the word salad doesn't deny your reality per se, though it may depend on what kinds of words the salad is made of, it is designed to confuse. Now one may wonder, now one may wonder, why does this even happen? My hypothesis for why narcissists engage in word salad is that it's due to a combination of rage, dysregulation, their tendency to not deal well with reality when they don't want to deal with it, 
and an inability to manage their inability to manage frustration all of that together may result in these bizarre verbal hiccups and over time when they are cornered they have learned i guess that just yammering on in a twisty turny way may actually get people off of their backs because there are likely any number of origins for why a narcissistic individual would engage in word salad it may also relate to the idea that different word salads may look different a rageful word salad will be loud and angry an entitled word salad will be victimized a grandiose or arrogant word salad will sound like a flight of fancy so when in the midst of all those confused words the only thing you will really hear is all of their narcissistic stuff just spewing out so what do you do the first time you encounter word salad I promise you you're going to be really confused you may even wonder early on if they're on drugs the second time it happens please view it as a wake-up call word salad like any salad is a mishmash of ingredients gaslighting false narratives and so on and so forth and your reactions may also be a mishmash of confusion fear anxiety and frustration narcissistic relationships are seductive because there's always something to do in a narcissistic relationship always a bizarre message to decode because they said something that's strange or always something to explain always something to defend against or there's always that Rubik's Cube of always trying to figure out what you need to do to win them over but these relationships are actually broken Rubik's cubes that are set up in a way that you can never quite solve them word salad becomes one more time in this relationship when you are trying to figure them out but there actually isn't that much to figure out we've already nailed it they're insecure they're conflictual they're antagonistic they can't cope they can't take responsibility they lash out at other people and that's about it it's one more example word salad is one more example of the chaos that's inherent in these relationships basically narcissists just make messes and leave other people to sort them out trying to find a Rosetta Stone to decode their word salad is not only a waste of your time it simply sucks you deeper into the narcissist's vortex if you have never encountered narcissistic word salad I guess just consider yourself fortunate in my experience I have observed it happening a little bit more with covert narcissists who tend to get a bit more emotionally overwhelmed they tend to be more socially anxious and they tend to get more confused but I'll be honest with you the grandiose narcissist who isn't getting his or her way or is going through some big disappointment is also quite vulnerable when word salad happens and you witness it it helps to know that it's coming and then when it happens you can almost smile to yourself like you knew it was coming no matter what the dressing is word salad rarely feels good and I can promise you it never tastes good and in some ways word salad is simply the encapsulation of a narcissistic temper tantrum and their gaslighting version of sort of speaking in narcissistic tongues all I can say about word salad is if you encounter it good luck to you 
I hope this video clarified word salad in a way that wasn't too word salady and that it actually made sense. Again, good luck to you if you encounter it. So let's go to it. Let's talk about ghosting. So what do you do when a person just poof, disappears, just done, and then nothing? You get blocked from all platforms. Emails don't get returned. Calls just ring. They don't even go to voicemail. And these days, since very few people have landlines, and that's not really an option anyhow. So there's a person in your life, and boom, they're gone. So when a person just disappears and does not respond, that's a phenomenon that's been called ghosting. And while we are talking about it and how it happens in a more technologically mediated era, when a person just doesn't let you in or doesn't respond on the numerous platforms you've got, social media and everything, this concept of ghosting has been around since people could be in touch. A whole stack of your letters not getting answered. Ghosting is the sudden and abrupt disappearance of a person from your life with little or no warning. So how, you're wondering, is this term ghosting really relevant to a narcissism dictionary? Because it's something that narcissists actually kind of like doing. Now this is the one term we're going to be talking about that doesn't entirely and solely live in the narcissism space. Ghosting takes in a lot more territory and in some cases, and we'll talk about that, it isn't always completely pathological. Ghosting feels bad because it's so sudden and it's so abrupt. There's not a real prelude to it. It's not somebody's like, hey, I'm not feeling this. This isn't working out. And maybe it would just be better for me if we weren't in touch anymore. You don't get that kind of buildup. So when they do disappear, you're not as surprised. In fact, they may even future fake you and say, hey, I'll see you again sometime. And then poof, they disappear. That makes it even sort of more crazy making. Now, narcissists do tend to be more cowardly by design. They find it hard to communicate clearly. And when the pressure is on and they don't want to experience any strong emotion or anything negative from another person, they just disappear. So instead of just taking responsibility or considering how it might feel for somebody else, if they were just to disappear without any notice, they don't think about it, obviously. Their lack of empathy makes it easy because they only account for their own discomfort. They don't want to deal with you. So there are lots of reasons though they may ghost. A narcissist may ghost because they've been dating multiple people and they chose the other people. They may do it because they're bored. They may feel like the relationship with you is too demanding. They may not like you or you may not be bringing them the narcissistic supply the way they want you to bring it. Now, no matter what, obviously it feels terrible. For some people, they may literally experience it as an outright abandonment. And as a result, being ghosted can sort of evoke feelings of panic or betrayal. For the rest of us who may not struggle as much with abandonment, it's just plain unsettling. And there's lots of rumination and wondering, did we say something? Did we do something? Like what just happened? But we must remember that in general, ghosting is not healthy. Now, it's very important that you don't confuse ghosting with something like no contact. No contact typically comes after many, many, many conversations about things not working out, about multiple ways of trying to make this relationship work. I mean, it's usually after a very long period and it can come after something that feels like a breakup conversation. The other person, even if they had half a brain, would know that you were discontent. By definition though, ghosting happens out of the blue. You may even have a nice time with someone and they'll even say they might want to see you again and then boom, they disappear and in, a, in that way, it's why it is so unsettling and why it feels so cowardly. Even a text or a message saying, hey, this wasn't working out for me, please don't ask me to explain and yeah, goodbye. It means that at least you know the person is gone. It may still may not feel good, but to have a person just go away, that really literally doesn't make sense to us. Now, ghosting, sadly, can bring out the worst in its victims. I have heard numerous stories of people using 
false number, phone numbers that can easily be created to lure the ghoster out of their ghosting. Here's the thing. It's really not a worthwhile strategy. The ghoster is clearly completely not that healthy. The ghoster is not likely to apologize or take responsibility for the behavior. And now you look a little like a low-level stalker, and that's never a good look. It is completely understandable why you or anyone would feel compelled to reach out just to make sense of what just happened. But in the end, the most circumspect position to take is to recognize that you probably dodged a bullet. And sometimes in life, we don't get to know why something happened. Now, ghosting, frankly, is lazy. And narcissists do tend to be quite lazy in their relationships. It's also a bit cowardly, which also fits the narcissistic mold. Now, most of the time, narcissistic ghosters will not come back and hoover. Now, it certainly, certainly can happen, but the ghosters do tend to be the ones with the avoidant attachment style. So they are the ones who leave the kitchen as soon as the heat comes on, and then they tend not to come back into the kitchen again. Now, can a family member ghost? Absolutely. It feels more strange. But if all of a sudden a family member you have contact with becomes invisible, it may not feel as ghosty because you can find them through other family members who probably still have contact with them, but they may make it known that they want nothing to do with you and that that person's not to give you any information. But ghosting is really largely an, a close relationship phenomenon. And it's typically something that happens relatively early in a relationship before you get to meet other people close to the ghoster. So it becomes harder to find them. There tends to be more accountability with more time. Now, there are plenty of people out there who ghost, but who are not narcissistic. And I know you guys are wondering about that. They may be people who are just simply not good at communication, people who are racked with guilt at the idea of having to break up with someone, people who really hate conflict, and uh, people who are, in fact, a little bit cowardly. So it may not be narcissism per se, but maybe more of an avoidant or guilt-driven relationship style. If other elements of a person are present, such as empathy, reciprocity, and compassion, ghosting may really just be an example of poor manners in the modern era. Some people may even argue that ghosting someone before date number three isn't even really ghosting and that you get a free pass to evaporate in the very early days of a relationship. But after some point, maybe after date three, ghosting is really just bad relationship hygiene. Now, narcissistic ghosting can have a very different feel. These are relationships that are typically not so love bomby, but instead these are the relationships that are a little bit more slippery. The dates may be pleasant enough, but even after the dates, it can be difficult to get in touch with them, they don't get in touch with you, or hard to even create a follow-up with them. You may cut their slipperiness some slack and say, ah, oh, they're just really busy and just write it off to their being busy. But when they finally do ghost you, then it's not shocking, but it still doesn't feel good. Now, just an aside, keep this in mind. Sometimes people ghost for reasons of safety, and I understand that. They get an uncomfortable feeling, they aren't that deep into the relationship, and they just don't want to interact with the person anymore. Now, again, what I'm about to say is subjective and completely unscientific, but in early days, and in an abundance of caution, if you step away quietly and disappear to avoid something, a relationship situation that seems to be getting a little bit sinister, that to me doesn't even qualify as anything like pathological ghosting. That's really just sort of saving yourself. Now in the grand scheme of things, those of you who get ghosted by a narcissist, consider yourself lucky. You got out or you were let go before the wounds cut too deep, or before you made too much of an investment. It would be a long period of hide and seek that you would have spent in this relationship. Now, ghosting is obviously far better than the horrible cycles of idealization, devaluation, and discarding. Nonetheless, it doesn't feel good. It can trigger old wounds around abandonment and insecurities and feelings of not being enough. 
that's work you can do for yourself on your own and not in the relationship. Far better that your ghoster waft into the night than you spend months and years being haunted by them. When I was putting together the glossary series, I was really like, I really went through everything I could find, blogs and what people have written and even books about narcissism to come up with all the terms. I was actually quite surprised when ghosting came up as a term in the narcissistic abuse sphere. Because like I said, ghosting is complex. Some of you may be watching this and saying, shoot, I ghosted, am I a narcissist? Uh -uh -uh. Like I said, pay attention. If you've got empathy and compassion, it's quite possible you ghosted someone because you really didn't want to hurt their feelings, because you really aren't good at conflict. And in fact, if, if anything, it was your empathy, it is your empathy that makes things rather tricky for you. So pay attention to that, that you, your reasons for sort of ghosting someone or walking out from someone early in a relationship without maybe explaining yourself may not qualify at all as what I'm calling here narcissistic ghosting. In the ghosting relationship, again, to review that, when it's with a narcissist, even the early days of dating with them are very hide-and-seeky. They're very inconsistent. These aren't your very intense love bomby narcissists. These aren't your texting 50 times a day narcissists. These are already the ones that are a little bit harder to pin down, and you start to wonder, like, what is the role you're playing in this person's life? And they literally might even future fake right from the jump. Hey, yeah, I look forward to taking you to this concert down the road, or I look forward to having you come to this, you know, place I love to go that's you know like a three hour drive away like they're actually throwing these plans at you for the future and that's often how narcissistic ghosting ghosting works even in the early days of the relationship and even though they're not consistent in how they communicate they do make these future promises so when they really do just evaporate for that reason narcissistic ghosting can be uncomfortable because you were sort of settling into this idea well this person must be interested they keep talking about these things we're going to do you start to recognize that they're actually using future faking in that case as almost a love bombing strategy and then the ghosting as a very convenient exit. I hope this gives some clarification on the complexities of this term ghosting, both the narcissistic version, the, the non-narcissistic version, and even the version that sometimes people use to protect themselves. Obviously, if your instincts tell you, I need to get out and I don't want this person to be able to find me, I don't even want to explain this or have contact with them, it's early enough, get out. And always safety, safety, safety first. That is one of the main canons of understanding narcissistic relationships. Thanks again for tuning in. As always, please hit the bell. Subscribe to this channel if you want more if you want more content on narcissism and narcissistic relationship. And also, those of you watching this series, one wonderful set of emails and messages we're getting is people who have ideas for other things that should go in the series. Right now it's a 21 day series and the nice thing is the daily surprise you get from each video as it comes out. Like, oh, I emailed Dr. Romani and I told her to do a video on such and such and here it comes. So it's very likely that the ideas you come up with might be days 22, 23, and 24. Absolutely open to them. These were the terms that came up to me, but I'd love to make this something that's dynamic and responsive to what everybody needs. Thanks again.